Well, good afternoon, friends. Good afternoon and good evening. It's really wonderful to welcome all of you here to CASBIS this afternoon, this evening, and also to welcome all of our friends who are watching this event on live stream. So welcome, we're really delighted to, to have you here. I am Sarah Soul, and I'm the director of CASBIS and also a professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And I cannot be more delighted to convene this important event tonight. This event, as you all know, is designed to recognize scholars for their distinguished contributions to the social and behavioral sciences. So as many of you also know, this event is sponsored by our partner, Sage Publications. The founder of SAGE, Sarah Miller McCune, cannot be with us here tonight, but she's certainly here in spirit, having endowed the directorship of this center and having long been a good friend and inspiration for the work that we do here at CASBIS. This award was established in 2013, and it recognizes outstanding achievement in the behavioral and social sciences. It underscores the role of social and behavioral sciences in enriching and enhancing public policy and good governance. SAGE is the proud underwriter of this award, and in a moment, we will, we will introduce the winners of the award. But I first wanted to thank the selection committee for this year's award. They include Robert or Bob Gibbons, Anna grismilla Busi, Jennifer Richeson, Blaise Simku, the CEO of, of SAGE, and our own Woody Powell, who you'll also get a chance to hear from tonight. I really want to thank this terrific group of scholars, many of whom have been fellows here at CASBIS, for their service. It's, it's, I know, a joy to serve on this kind of committee, especially when we get to honor the, the kinds of scholars that we are going to this evening. So today, we get to honor <laughs> the two winners of the Sage Casbis Award, Elizabeth Anderson and Alondra Nelson. I'm going to begin by introducing each of them. I'm going to present them. I get the great honor and joy of presenting the awards. And then we get to hear from them both. And we also get to hear a conversation with Woody and the two of them. So this is going to be very exciting. So the list of accomplishments and accolade, accolades for these two impressive scholars is um, very difficult to properly address in the few minutes that I've been allotted. So I'm going to try to keep this somewhat brief, knowing that you've all had a chance to read the wonderful announcement that we put together when we announced the winners, and there are hard copies floating around here too, and also knowing that I'm pretty certain everybody in the room knows of their impressive list of accomplishments. So I'll begin by talking a little bit about Elizabeth. So Elizabeth Anderson has a lengthy list of endowed titles. She's the Arthur F. Thurnau Professor and the John Dewey Distinguished University Professor of Philosophy and Women's Studies, and, and also the Max Shea Professor of Public Philosophy at the University of Michigan. She's an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a corresponding fellow of the British Academy, a member of the American Philosophical Society, and the recipient of at least two honorary degrees. Many of you have read her work. She's the author of several books, including Value in Ethics and Economics, The Imperative of Integration, Pri Private Government, How Employers, Our Lives, and Why We Don't Talk About It, and her latest book, just from earlier this year, Hijacked, How Neoliberalism Turned the Work Ethic Against Workers and How Workers Can Take It Back. She's known above all else, and here I'm stealing from the MacArthur Foundation when they bestowed their genius award uh, on her in 2019 for employing pragmatist methods to examine ways that various institutions, policies, and social practices serve to promote or hinder democratic equality and human flourishing. Elizabeth has been called by the New Yorker, the philosopher redefining equality. But that, dis that description, I think, shortchanges her amazing and, and, and deep contributions. 
She has and continues to generate foundational insights at the intersection of philosophy, history, economics, and the social sciences more broadly. And I think this really gets to the core of why Woody Powell noted in the June announcement that Elizabeth's commitment and what her work represents align fully with the fundamental principles that we embrace here at CASBIS. And I think Woody is so right on this. And this is the primary reason why I am so proud that Elizabeth is with us here tonight. So congratulations, Elizabeth. After I share just a, just a few words, which is going to be hard, as I said, about Alondra, I'm going to invite you both up to the podium to receive um, your awards, and which in include both a lovely plaque as well as a monetary award from SAGE. So Alondra Nelson is just an absolutely brilliant scholar and gifted leader. Um, she's led many institutions, as many of us know, and I think it, importantly for all of us, she has deeply penetrated the wider public consciousness in the past three years especially. Alondra is the Harold F. Linder Chair and Professor of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study, and she's held previous academic appointments at Columbia and Yale Universities. She's also a distinguished fellow um, at the Center for American Progress, and among other things, she's held deanships of social science and, at Columbia and was the former president and CEO of the uh, Social Science Research Council. Alondra's, Alondra's books include two that I've really appreciated reading over the years, Body and Soul, The Black Panther Party, and the Fight Against Medical Discrimination, and The Social Life of DNA, Race, Reparations, and Reconciliation After the Genome. She's also edited several incredibly important and impressive um, edited books, such as The um, Unsettled Past, The Collision of DNA, Race, and History. So Alondra is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, the National Academy of Medicine, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Our June announcement noted that Alondra brought intellect and administrative leadership experience into public service as few social scientists have, uh, have done. And this was because of her 2021, January 2021 appointment by President Joe Biden as Deputy Director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Her selection reflected a new commitment to, focus, uh, to, to a critical focus on equality, civil rights, and an ethics lens on science and technology policy. And we all thank you for that. In February of 2022, Alondra became the acting director of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and the deputy assistant to the president, whereupon she became the first African American and first woman of color to lead US science and technology policy. Among many other accomplishments in this role, she's helped lead the efforts uh, on federally funded research um, accessibility, scientific integrity, and on a bill of rights for protecting privacy, enhancing transparency, and promoting equity in the use of artificial intelligence technologies. On the heels of her government service, in February of this year, Nature selected Alondra as one of 10 people who has helped shape science in 2022. Now this is not just social and behavioral sciences, this is all of science. Time Magazine also named her as one of the 100 most influential people in artificial intelligence. So I have to say that when Blaise Simku, who again can't be with us tonight, the CEO of SAGE, he knew exactly what he was talking about in June in that announcement when he noted that Alondra sets new standards through probing social science scholarship that centers equity in science, technology, the public, and policy. He also said that she has done a service to society and to social science by firming up connections between them both. I wholeheartedly agree with Blaze, and congratulations, Alondra.
So now I get the best part of this job ever, and that is I have the honor of bestowing awards on these two remarkable scholars who we are honored to have here in our presence tonight. So maybe what I will do is first invite Elizabeth up to the podium, and I'm going to step around front with your um, award. We'll get to hear from just a minute uh, from both of the scholars and also the discussion with Woody, but I also want now to invite Alondra Nelson up to the podium. This is the best job ever. OK, so I'm going to now turn the podium over to Elizabeth Anderson. And uh, why don't you come on up to the podium, and we will begin with the first talk of the evening. I just want to say it's such a thrill to be here and to give you a really brief address. I'm really looking forward to our conversation shortly. Um, so I'm just going to say a few words um, about what is equality and why should we want it. And in the New Yorker, I was called the philosopher's redefining equality. So I just want to explain my conception of equality. Um, what is egalitarianism? What, what does it want? I define this as a relational ideal. It's an ideal of what a free society of equals would look like. And it's important to emphasize the freedom part too. On this conception, freedom and equality are perfectly compatible. Indeed, they need each other. And the reason for that is that when you focus on the quality of our social relationships, you can see that a relationship in which one person dominates another person that is simultaneously a relationship of inequality and of unfreedom, right? The person being dominated does not have freedom. So it's through this relational conception that I want to unite these ideals. And of course, domination is not just between one person and another. There can also be institutional structures that dominate whole groups of people. And that's where we need to bring in the social sciences. It's not just a psychological issue, but also sociological, economic, political science, and so forth. All the social sciences get wrapped up in this idea. By stressing the quality of our social relationships, I don't want to set aside distributive equality, but I want to get our heads out of the idea that egalitarianism has to do with arithmetic has to do essentially with how much do I have compared to how much you have, whether that be money or resources, wealth, income. Doesn't mean that those things aren't important. But I understand the importance of distributive equality, <clears throat> which doesn't have to be strictly, strictly ar arithmetic equality. The importance of distribution is People need enough to stand in relations of equality with others. And you can't have people who are so vastly more wealthy that, in effect, they can't be held accountable for how they exercise the powers that wealth gives them. So distribution is important, but it's channeled through this deeper ideal of a free society of equals. Critically, if you look at the history of egalitarian thought, it's always been defined in opposition to social hierarchy. 
It's very characteristic of egalitarian thinking that it's super sharp on critique, <laughs> right? You see a form of social inequality, <clears throat> and egalitarians are really good at explaining why it's unjust, why it's oppressive, why it's bad for people. <laughs> And then, of course, the task has always been for egalitarians to articulate what the positive ideal of equality is. And that's why I have this image here of a chair, because in the first instance, what egalitarians do is they're kind of sketching out the outlines of a chair by crossing out everything they don't like, <laughs> right? And then the chair emerges. But nevertheless, you still have to fill in the design details of the chair. Like, what does the upholstery look like, <laughs> right? Um, and that's always been the great challenge of envisioning what relationships of equality would even look like. And that's what I call the positive ideal of an egalitarian society. The negative ideal is, let's get rid of all these oppressive hierarchies, right? But the positive ideal is, trying to replace hierarchical relationships with relations of social equality. And that replacement is necessary because social hierarchy does perform certain functions. You know, you have ways of, you know, that are socially necessary. Like you gotta raise the kids, you have to produce enough for society to like survive. Um, hierarchy does serve those functions to a certain degree. And consequently, you can't just get rid of it the way you might say, get rid of some horrible virus like smallpox and never have to see it again. You have to replace it with something positive, okay? Um, <clears throat> and I just wanna give you some examples. I think these are three stellar examples of that envisioning of what equality could look like. So one, we have a very long tradition of democratic social movements, which are all about replacing monarchy, dictatorships, all kinds of autocracy with democracy, right? Democracy is a way of conceiving the equality of citizenship, the equality of citizens to each other, where citizens take responsibility for the nature of the government and the legislation and hold government officials accountable. That's, a, that's really critical to the freedom aspect of democracy, is that you cannot have unaccountable power in a fully realized democracy. So that's one great contribution of, I think, a relational egalitarianism which has powered a very important social movement. Another one comes from the feminist movement, replacing the relationship of a patriarch to a wife who is his servant and helper but who must obey her husband's judgment to the ideal of companionate marriage. The ideal that, well, people in marriage, it's about love, it's about intimacy, friendship, it's about sharing an emotional connection and sharing and being friends. That ideal of intimate partnership now has recently been expanded to not just beyond, you know, beyond heterosexual relationships to any kind of partnership regardless of the gender identity and sexual orientation uh, of the parties. And thirdly, this is very important, is that a lot of hierarchy is manifested through certain social identities as a race or caste or ethnicity or uh, <clears throat> gender identity, sexual orientation, where one group is exalted above the other in esteem and standing in the sense of who counts and who doesn't count. Those are hierarchies that egalitarians oppose. And one way of opposing them, again, very powerful social movement behind it, human rights, right? Everybody is entitled to the same human rights. I could go on, but we don't have a lot of time, so I'm just gonna give you those three 
ideas of positive ideals that to a certain degree have been realized in the world. But importantly, this is essential for understanding egalitarianism. These are always works in progress. We never end our development and deeper and fuller and richer articulation of the content of these ideals, all with the aim of supporting the freedom in relations of equality of everyone. So then the question is, well, why should we want this? Now, I could go on and on, but I don't have time to tell you about principles of justice. But I'm going to set that aside and instead <clears throat> just make the very simple point that hierarchy is really bad for people. Now, it's pretty obvious that it's bad for people at the bottom. What is it like to be stigmatized, to be despised simply because of one's social identity, whether that be of race or gender, sexual orientation, and so forth? Obviously, that's horrible. And similarly, to be subject to domination by someone who holds unaccountable power over you, you know abuse is going to happen. <laughs> okay, Or to be a member of a group of people whose interests simply don't count in the system or society in which they live. Obviously awful. So hierarchy is bad for people at the bottom, but what about the people at the top? And here I think is one of the most interesting things about egalitarian thinking, is that it also manifests sympathy for people at the top because they also are not served well by social hierarchy, however much they might think they are. So first of all, there's moral corruption. If you have unaccountable power, what happens? You become arrogant, vain. You end up boasting of your vices. I'm sure we can all think of contemporary examples. <laughs> but Adam Smith noted this in his great work, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, that the adulation of the rich and powerful leads the rich and powerful to even boast of their vices. We can also worry about the isolation of those on the top, their ignorance. They're so isolated, they don't know about their subordinates at all or what's happening. Their emotional stunting. These were great themes, both of Plato, who argued that in the Republic that the tyrant really can't have friends. And the reason why is because tyrants only understand relations of domination and subjection. And there's no true friendship between a dominant person and a subordinate person. Subordinate person always has to be on their guard. They can't really be open. Okay, Plato and John Stuart Mill, great theme, egalitarian themes about the loneliness of people on the top and how pathetic that condition really can be. At the social level, when you have whole classes of society that are subordinated and stigmatized, you tend to get economic backwardness. Uh, and societies where women are not empowered but are uh, suppressed and don't have liberty, like they can't even drive a car, <laughs> those are really backward societies. Even if they might technically be resource rich, they're actually economically backward. And we also know that more equal societies overall are healthier. They're more trusting. They're less violent. They have lower crime. Overall, more equal societies, people just treat each other better. And that's a healthier way to be. So I just want to conclude with two important figures, uh, egalitarian thinkers. One uh, is Heather McGee, who just wrote a wonderful book called The Sum of Us. She says, we are greater than and greater for the sum of us. And what she stresses here, I think, is incredibly important in the history of egalitarian thinking. Egalitarians are always looking for win-win propositions. We're looking for opportunities where if someone less advantaged gets lifted up, that's fundamentally what lifts everybody up. Okay, <clears throat> it's, 
It's hierarchy that encourages in us a zero-sum logic according to which I can gain only at someone else's expense. And finally, John Stuart Mill, who famously argued in The Subjection of Women, a great feminist work, that the only school of genuine moral sentiment is a society between equals. And I want you to reflect on that a bit. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you. And now I get to invite Alondra to the podium to share some thoughts with us too. Thank you, Alondra. here because I've got a little bit of a scratchy throat. So um, good evening, everybody. Um, we've only been given about 20 minutes. Um, and I'm going to burn up a few of those minutes with gratitude because we get so few um, moments for public gratitude. So um, uh, I'm going to cut short um, a little bit what I wanted to say of substance because um, I'm just so deeply grateful. I'm grateful to um, have as a pure winner Elizabeth Alexander, if I, Anderson. Elizabeth Alexander is one of my very best friends. Um, um, Elizabeth Anderson, who I've admired for a very long time. I mean, what what a tremendous, I mean, it's the extra gift. It's the extra prize of this. Um, so thank you for that. Um, thank you to the selection committee. Thank you to Sage Publishing, to Casbis, um, to Woody, and to Sarah. Uh, directors here, past and present, to Blaise Simku, and of course to Sarah Miller McCune, who's not here, who is a co-founder of Sage Publishing, a good friend and has been a mentor to me for many, many years. Um, I also want to thank um, folks who've been just traveling with me in various journeys for many times who are here. So JSB and Margaret Levy, um, past, uh, Margaret's past um, director here at CASVIS, Marianne Fricard, um, who I've been thinking with almost my entire career, um, Jenny Reardon, uh, ditto, um, and many others besides. Um, and um, I've got some new friends here. I found myself in the last few years in the world of, of thinking about the social implications of artificial intelligence technologies and AI policy and governance. And um, those uh, friends were down at the Gates building um, in a workshop today. And they've come up the hill, some of them, to spend some time. So thank you all for, for coming. It's good to see you here as well. And just thank you all for being here. So. Um, and I'm also just grateful for the honor and privilege of having um, fields of inquiry that early in my career um, had people knit their brows, gave people cognitive dissonance when you said, I work on race and science, I work on race and technology, I work on race, science, medicine, and social inequality, um, to now have these be established fields with lots of people working in them, and I hope lesser knit brows is just a, a tremendous, tremendous um, gift and privilege. So I'm going to talk um, just a little bit about, um, about equity, about a, a category that is not a social science category, really. Um, and I've been trying to wrap my head um, after working uh, in government um, in, in which the category of equity as a sociopolitical category, particularly in this administration, has done and continues to do quite a lot of work. So I've been trying to think as a social scientist about this category. But I first want to say a little bit about how I, I sort of got here. So some of you may know, or may not know. I mean, for many years, I was writing a book about the Obama Office of Science and Technology Policy that I came to work in, I was interviewing people who had worked in that office um, for a couple of reasons. I mean, it's um, uh, in part because President Obama uh, so the bridge for me as a sociologist of science and technology and race in part was um, that you had uh, the very first African-American president um, that arguably had the most sort of audacious and capacious science and technology policy agenda of a president in recent memory um, and who was willing to talk about, um, as I think is important to do, um, the, the sort of misgivings, the crimes, um, the, the damage that science and technology has done and could do, particularly in communities of color, uh, and yet also understood that it could be a tremendous source uh, of good if harnessed well. I was particularly interested in thinking about um, the, the sort of ethical uh, terrain that President Obama brought to 
science and technology policy for the very first time. That was really encapsulated in one of his last international visits as president. He would go to the Hiroshima Memorial Park in Japan, um, and, and a really tremendous speech there would say, technological progress without equivalent progress in human institutions can doom us. The scientific revolution um, requires a moral revolution as well. So, so that's how I got here. It's how I came to be um, and a network of, a social network of people that would lead to my, in my mind, very unlikely appointment um, in the Biden-Harris uh, White House. I would come to um, have uh, off it to, to be part of the executive office of the president, which is sort of the second concentric circle from the West Wing, um, which is in this administration about 17 offices. It includes offices you know, like the Council of Economic Advisors and the National Security Council, National Economic Council, as well as the Office of Science and Technology Policy. So my appointments um, uh, happens very quickly. It's announced um, in January. Um, and the day after my appointment is announced um, on, a, uh, on a stage with President-elect Biden in, in Wilmington, Delaware, the uh, then soon to be chief of staff of the incoming White House sends a memo to incoming senior staff talking about the four overlapping and compounding crises that this administration would be facing, the COVID-19 crisis, the economic crisis, the climate crisis, and the racial equity crisis. So a couple of things to say here. It's not hard to see how science and technology policy run through each of these. And in some ways, this was a kind of culmination of things I've been working on for a very long time, health inequality, uh, racial inequality, um, um, you know, cleaner technology for the clean down transition, pandemic preparedness. All of this was now being um, uh, um, directed towards the Biden-Harris administration that was just coming, and we were asked to pay attention to equity issues throughout it as well. So a couple of days later, this is January 20th, um, the president would issue his very first executive order. So <coughs> just to explain briefly, um, presidents issued lots of executive orders. As of this week, President Biden has issued 124 executive orders, including one you probably know about from a couple of weeks ago on artificial intelligence. Um, but uh, the first executive order then on the first days um, are very important symbolically because they're the sort of cornerstone commitments of the, of the administration. And on this first day, um, uh, the very first executive order was the what we call the Equity EO, this executive order on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities um, through the federal government. So there were nine signed on this day. This was the very first one. Um, you know, Ron Klain had promised uh, here the president will take decisive action to address these four crises in the first 10 days in office, and this is the first executive order. So there would be executive orders on pandemic preparedness, on climate, and, and, and elsewhere on day one, but the equity one was the first and the first on day one. And it would come to take on um, a really important role in the Biden-Harris administration. And things such as the White House Steering Committee on Equity, there's lots of things named for equity in the administration, I just pulled a few. <laughs> COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, the Equitable Data Working Group, which I co-chaired with a colleague in OMB, Justice 40, the sort of sense that um, an environmental justice uh, commitment that 40% of all benefits of clean energy, climate change, affordable housing, and other federal funding would go to marginalized poor, uh, populations that have been disproportionately affected by pollution and historically excluded from um, mitigations of these. So I'm an ethnographer. I mean, sometimes I'm a historian, mostly I'm an ethnographer. So I go into DC, I go to the White House um, as an ethnographer. And so I'm actually quite curious about the category of equity because it's not a social science category. And so I was kind of like, you know, what do we mean by equity? And what is it, what's it doing here? And how are we thinking about it? And how are we defining it? Um, and the categories that we're much more used to, I mean, we think back um, to, to Liz's presentation, are, you know, political philosophers, equality, social science, you know, my role sign of the social science is much more negative, <laughs> less optimistic, you know, prejudice, discrimination, subtitle of my very first monograph was about medical discrimination, social stratification, um, which neutrally is just the hierarchies that Liz was talking about, but, you know, also has, um, uh, you know, um, uh, normative um, implications as well, poverty and wealth, more sort of philosophically or more in the world of political philosophy, you might think about the role of fairness with respect to inequality. Equity's not here. It's not, not really something that we quite think about. 
Um, and if drilling down just a little bit, if we think about wealth, it was, I was curious that you pulled out the, the sort of wealth bits as well, actually. I, I didn't realize we were both going to do that. Um, but you know, some of the questions that we ask about wealth are, um, are not quite normative questions and not quite moral questions. I mean, we, 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 you know, what is the distribution of household wealth in a city, a country, a state? How do we transmit inequality, be that poverty or wealth across generations? What's the re relevance of wealth for stratification, for social stratification? How do we track and assess trends in wealth inequality? None of that tells us, we do a lot of work in the social sciences. This is all a lot of work, a lot of work, a lot of peer reviewed articles, lots of data collection, lots of teams out in the field, um, you know, lots of data analytics. Um, but it often doesn't tell us, then what do you do? Like, we kind of just stop there. Um, sometimes in our NSF grants, we will say, um, there's broader implications here, and you've given me 500 words to say something about that, but, but you know, we, we often don't say um, much more than that. One other that I just wanted to pull from the data, and then we've got this, this um, important research, you know, important um, uh, in science, but I think also important in the public sphere for shaping how people um, think about science. So this was a paper from 2017 that some of you will remember from Starman, um, Shushkin, and my former Yale colleague, Paul Bloom, why people prefer um, unequal societies. Um, I'll, you know, some of you are familiar with it, recent research in social psycho psychology, um, that people, um, that inequality, this study found, um, is preferred um, if it's deemed fair, right? If, if there was something about the way that the inequality was accomplished that is somehow deemed fair. So the question then, but going back to equity, is how do you aspire to redress? And in, in the, if the court of public opinion, at least according to this study, um, suggests that uh, people want um, are okay with inequality if they feel like it, you know, that's just fair shakes and how we got there. So I want to suggest to you, and as I've been trying to think through um, the power of equity um, as a as a term and as a sociopolitical uh, sort of concept. I want to think about it as a bit as a meme, and I want to take you through the kind of um, genealogy of this idea as it came to sit in civil society and other organizations outside of the ivory tower of academia. So some of you might not know this particular image. You know a version of it that I'm going to show you. You don't know this one. So probably this is the first one. Um, it was um, created in 2012 by a, a, a University of Cincinnati business professor named Craig Froley. It was shortly after um, Barack Obama, he said, had um, been elected again, and he was fighting with a conservative friend, and he wanted to f describe to this conservative friend why equal opportunity alone was not a satisfactory goal, and that we should somehow take into consideration equality of outcomes. So according, Professor Foley says that he um, found an image that he thought actually was the, the baseball park in Cincinnati, in Cincinnati. If you can see, it's actually an actual photographic image with like clip art. Like, you know, he basically was like, I sat down and I tried to think of this thing and I put it together. You know, it's sort of not elegant in its, in its um, aesthetic. So this is how we, this, this sort of meme sorts to begin. And he writes this sort of very moving account by 2016, four years later, about how it basically travels everywhere and becomes a very powerful description of equity and gives equity a kind of traction and a political sense that it didn't have before. So this is probably the one that you're more familiar with, right? So this is from um, the uh, Interaction Institute for Social Change. An artist named Agnes McGuire was commissioned by the IISC to do this um, in 2014. Um, and you'll see it's now all in the, it's all graphic. It's not for, for, for part photograph and graphic. Um, so this is how it, it comes to live, I think, in many of our minds now. But Froley takes us through a kind of genealogy of how, of some of the memification of this image and how it changes over time. So for him, initially, um, it was like talking to a conservative, uh, you know, conservative and liberal, how might you think about equality differently? You know, who needs more help? The meme really took off, uh, Professor Foley tells us, when Professor Jonathan Haidt used it in a lecture in 2013 um, to, to, to make exactly this point and added the to a conservative, to a liberal on this. So some of the images I'll show you will be like people layering their different interpretations on, on this kind of social political uh, meme, right? 
And so then we get to the questions of, um, you know, some of which will be interesting to talk about with Liz, about whether or not equality is justice, is equality fairness, is equity something else besides? This is equality, this is justice, is one iteration of that. Equality is not always justice. Another iteration of this meme, this is from 2013, fair isn't equal. If we're thinking about the, the paper that I showed you from, from Nature, fair is when everyone gets what they need. All right. So this sociopolitical mean, meme you know, takes on this kind of institutional world. These are just some of the organizations that I picked from Professor Foley's um, own writing about this, that, that these were some of the examples of the different organizations, philanthropy, civil society, NGOs, um, nonprofits, uh, higher education organizations, and the like. So this is the commission piece um, from uh, 2014 from um, uh, illustrating equality and equity that has become very familiar with us. Um, and I wanna just, and I'm gonna just have a few more slides before I wrap up. What I want to point out here um, that's different about um, the, our academic research on inequality, or equality as the case may be, um, is, is I think what's so powerful about this image is that it's in action. The play is underway, right? Not just the baseball game, but like there's an activity that's happening that, that can, something can be done about it in this moment, right? It is calling the viewer to sort of do something in a particular way, and I think ways that other kinds of representations of, say, structural inequality don't quite do. In fact, they seem quite foreboding because you feel like there's nothing you can quite do, right? Generations and generations of compounded inequality, what do you do about that? But this is saying there's a game underway, we want the kids to see the game right now, something you can do right now, right? So it's just action. It suggests that inequality or inequity is sort of patent and clear that it can be seen and that it can be mitigated. Um, you know, I think social scientists uh, know that it's a bit harder than that. Um, and that action can and must be taken, that there's a there's sort of avenue for redress if one wants to take it, and it's showing you what the clear action for redress is. So let me go back in closing to this day one equity executive order and just tell you how, um, I, what I've come to think about how this gets sort of taken up um, in sort of political work and actually in policy. So the equity EO includes a couple of things I wanna point out just in closing. It brings into itself under the umbrella of equity, fairness, justice, policy, and inequality, right? So in a kind of social science sense, it creates this sort of master category that absorbs, right, the other ways that we might think about inequality or, not, or, or, or or equality, fairness, justice, poverty, and equality. So for the purpose of this order, the term equity means the consistent and sy systemic, fair, dressed, and impartial treatment of all individuals, right, including individuals who preserve, belong to underserved communities that have been denied such treatment. So the list here is also more capacious than category, than the title, right, then it's, it's about advancing racial equity, but the sort of people who are subject to this expansion of expanding equity is fairly broad. Black, Latino, indigenous, Native American persons, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, other persons of color, religious minorities, LGBTQ plus persons, persons with disabilities, persons who live in rural areas, persons otherwise affected by persistent poverty or inequality, right? So equity becomes this huge, capacious category and therefore sort of um, very politically potent, sociopolitically potent. Last um, slide here. The term underserved communities, I just want to point out here the historic, the redress piece. The, the underserved communities refers to a population sharing a particular characteristic as well as geographic communities that have been systematically denied, right, inherent, in, implicitly over time a full opportunity to participate in aspects of economic, social, and civic life. So um, uh, I'm gonna stop there, um, but um, thank you for the opportunity to think with you about the last couple of years of my life if I tried to square the corners of equity with a whole career in thinking about social inequality. Thanks very much.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Alondra. So now I have the great privilege of um, inviting both of our award winners, Elizabeth and Alondra, and our own Woody Powell, who was the um, director of CASBIS just before I. And he is um, a good friend of CASBIS. He's a multi multiple time fellow here at CASBIS, and this year is spending a lot of his time up here on the Hill as a faculty fellow, um, and we're delighted, Woody, that you agreed to um, have a conversation with our two award winners about some of the topics that they have so eloquently um, discussed with us tonight. So please, all of you, please join us up front. Thank you. <clears throat> climb up that you don't go <laughs> sailing away. Yeah, they look a little high. <laughs> yeah, they are a little. Okay. But we're here. Okay. <laughs> um, so hi, this is really a, um, a pleasure and a treat to, uh, to get to talk with the two of you. And um, I have some questions that I think will get the two of you talking to one another. So I get out of the way and we get to listen to the two of you. And then I have some that are more intended for each of you individually, but that I hope the other will comment on. And so maybe we start with the concepts you gave us, um, egalitarian and equity. And I'd love to hear you kind of define the differences between them, if there are, and maybe reflect a bit on like who gets to decide fairness. <laughs> well, I'll kick it off then. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I actually think we're, we're thinking in compatible ways, because I did stress that equality shouldn't be understood mathematically, like how much I have compared to how much you have. It is much, and relationships are dynamic and, and happening through time. And, and so you want to make sure that to relate as an equal means you make sure that you are accountable when you, when you exercise your freedom, you're accountable to everyone you affect. You, you have to make sure that you're treating people with respect, not treating them as, you know, this despicable, lowly, you know. And you have to make sure that you are taking other people's interests, perspectives, and concerns into account. And that's what I call equality of standing. So when you think about relationships as a dynamical like way or process of interacting with other people around you, and of course institutions also create structures of interaction, so we always have to think also structurally. And structurally too, institutions could be systematically neglectful of certain groups, interests, perspectives, and concerns. They could, in their structure end up stigmatizing certain groups and they could dominate. And so those are all simultaneously unequal and inequitable in their process of working themselves out and doing whatever they're doing. Yeah, I do think they're this quite compatible. I think but the, I think the equity as a kind of social political category is making a second move, right? So there is an assumption of, um, of equality, right? Um, that has not been manifest in outcomes. Um, and therefore, you know, there, the other um, interventions must be made to sort of, you know, mitigate or, or try to sort of create um, something that looks like the positive ideal of equality that's been, um, not able to be achieved for well, you know uh, as, uh, whatever reasons. Um, so um, yeah, so so I think that's that's what I would would offer. But again, I would say um, I feel uh, you know it feels very curious to be um, you know the the sort of Vanna White for equity because it it was um, it, it was not a category that that I used in my work or I use in my work right until I became um, until I came to work in the policy space. Um, but it's a very efficacious category. And so now I feel, as a social as a sociologist, like, you know, I'm a sociologist of equity as like a, a topic. Like, mm -hmm. I'm actually quite interested and obsessed with sort of 
finding out what it does in the world um, and, and how it does what it does in the world. I mean, obviously, you know, having the president of the United States say equity is a thing, mm -hmm. um, you know, makes it a thing. But, um, <laughs> um, but, but you know, I think, but I think political leaders both, you know, sometimes they do things that are, um, are sort of very vanguard, but often is the culmination of what they understand people to want, right? And so how do we get to a place where um, people want an equity frame for political work? So, you know, so that's the kind of question that I'm like noodling on these days. So in your earlier work, Alondra, you would have thought about health inequalities, right? Yes, and I, so and I did now, indeed, yeah. Right, yeah. and so now you want to think about health inequities, which has a necessarily a reparative side to it? Is that I would think so, right? I mean, I think that we, at least, so, maybe. I mean, I think okay. in, the, in the, I mean, in the social, well, I guess there's a prodding on two ends. I mean, on the, to social scientists, and this really comes out of, I think, having worked in the policymaking space. I mean, also having done um, uh, some of the work we were doing at the Social Science Research Council, you know, um, in parallel with the work that Margaret was here doing here at CASBIS. I mean, it is really a moment for social behavioral sciences to do more in the world and to be better at translating what we do into like things that you know are transformative for the world and improve the world. And so, um, part of my so so I think to the extent that that an equity that saying health equity instead of health inequality, mm -hmm. I think brings action. There's some, you know, something to be done here, I think, to the table or to the framework. I think that's useful um, in, for, in the social sciences for taking that up. But sure, I mean, I think pre previously I wrote about health discrimination, health inequality. Um, those were categories that I used, and certainly in my first book. And I wrote about, I mean, I'm a political sociologist as well, so I wrote about social actors um, sort of taking that up and, and sort of fighting against it, but, but with a sense that those fundamental structures remained. <coughs> Elizabeth, um, a famous philosopher, said the point is not to critique society but to change it. So you gave us a list of the ways in which um, hierarchy is actually bad for people <coughs> at the top and the bottom. It's easy to see how you might persuade people at the bottom of that argument. How do you go about persuading people at the top? Well, that's a really great question. <laughs> so not everyone can be persuaded. <laughs> but <laughs> I do think that if you think about, a lot of sociology talks about categorical inequality. Like men, all men, superior to all women in a, in a patriarchal society, or say in a, ra in a ra racist society, all whites above, right, all people of color. But in fact, if you drill down into the details, this is not accurate. And the reason why is famously called intersectionality. Is it really all men? Like, what about black men? Are they really above all women, including white women? Not exactly. <laughs> um, Right, but there are other reasons too, and this has to do with a really deep idea that uh, the great philosopher Rousseau wrote an essay called On the Origins of Inequality. And he's asking the question like, why do we even have inequality? And what he's asking is like, why do we have social hierarchy? And in particular, class hierarchy. And he said at, at the kind of psychological level, it's all about esteem competition. People want to feel superior to other people. <laughs> And when you think about it, esteem competition never goes away. Within any given category, say men, <laughs> there's competition among men to be who is the alpha man, <laughs> right? Well, when you think about that, and I commented briefly about the lo logic, zero sum logic of inequality, it never ends. So in fact, most men don't really get a great deal from patriarchy because, you know, how many people can be at the top? Not many. In fact, many men are actually oppressed by patriarchy. Gay men, for instance, they're not considered real men. 
most black men are not considered real men. I could go on. Poor men, disabled men. There's a lot of losers. And as inequality intensifies, as we get greater and greater inequality, more and more people come to recognize that they're not getting such a great deal. Now we add to that the further thought coming from Heather McGee, but in fact, there's a very long tradition of anti-racist thinkers. You can find very similar thoughts in Du Bois. And that is, if you, want to, if you actually look at the economic history of the United States South, the best thing that happened to white workers in the 19th century was the abolition of slavery, even though they themselves were not enslaved, and Reconstruction. Why? Because under slavery, white men without property and who were too poor to own slaves themselves, there was no economic place for them. They needed jobs, but who would hire them when they could get slaves to work for free? So in fact, they were desperately poor, despised, and degraded. What happened in Reconstruction, that brief period of a wonderful experiment in racial equality? The Republican Party at the time was a biracial coalition of whites and blacks. And what did they do? They established the first publicly funded school system in the South. Whites gained from that as well. The second best thing that ever happened to white workers in the South, this is just the economics of it, was the second reconstruction, that is the civil rights movement. The great e economist Gavin Wright crunched the numbers and what he found was the 1964 Civil Rights Act that prohibited racial discrimination in employment basically liberated a lot of black workers who used their newfound civil rights <coughs> to get better jobs. And white, white workers were thinking, oh, they're going to take away our jobs. But in fact, that didn't happen. What happened was a new group of people were now energized to get training and skills, dramatically upgrading the overall skill level of the working class population in the South. And what you saw was economic takeoff. South, the South was a completely backward, impoverished region of the country. And famously, after 1964, you actually see regional convergence, massive economic growth, spurred by the empowerment and development of talents of black workers actually lifted the white working class. The rights argument is very rigorous on this. And this is some of us thinking, right? That is that people, people think they gain by keeping other people down. But in fact, you, your own life gets enriched by empowering and opening up opportunities for less advantaged people. It's a lesson we keep on having to learn again and again. So I, I want to believe you. I mean, I, I believe the data. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the data. I believe the data. But in the same period is also the beginnings of the carceral state, right? And so you have, particularly in the South, the expansion of this whole sort of carceral prison ecosystem um, for black people that employed white, you know, poor white, you know, um, non-professionals. I mean, I don't, I would have to think about those data together, but um, I guess I wouldn't want to over, over interpret uh, the right study. Well, I mean, black wages raised were raising too. I mean, they, they were also lifting. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, it, look, I mean, this is, this is characteristic of how of, of how the contest between equality and inequality happens, right? That is that you can make steps forward in certain respects, but there's backlash as well that has to be dealt with. Yep. Yeah. But, you know, it's <laughs> even when it comes to that, prison jobs, prison guard jobs are horrible jobs. They're brutalizing. I, I, they really are. And actually, 
it's much better to be like manufacturing furniture or something like that, even if it's boring, than being a guard. And we've gotten ourselves into an economy where you have so many, not great jobs, but at least they were like halfway decent jobs have disappeared, that people are now desperate, especially in rural areas, <clears throat> for really degrading and debasing jobs. These are horrible jobs. I mean, in terms of, you're in a fundamentally antagonistic environment, day after day. It's deeply, profoundly traumatizing for the prisoners, but it's also really profoundly traumatizing for the guards. I'm gonna come back with, to you both on employment issues, but you seem to hint at something that runs through both your work, which is an idea about human flourishing and um, uh, you know, in different ways you've tackled it. Um, Alondra, your book, Body and Soul, uh, kind of beautifully described the health, the educational, the cultural um, aspects of, uh, um, uh, that often went unnoticed to the Black Panther Party. Um, and Elizabeth, your work has traced a lineage from Mill to Marx about what you call mutual sympathy. Um, so I'd love for each of you to talk a bit about what you think are critical elements of flourishing. So I would say I mean, one of the things um, that happened during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, I, I appreciate that we're still um, in it in some regards, or maybe I don't know if we've had a declaration from the WHO that says we're now endemic or something else. but. Um, was that that but Body and Soul, the book, took on a new life. Um, um, and I had a lot of engagement and interaction and lots of people writing about mutual aid um, and, and really thinking and looking at that moment in history of um, you know, communities being very much shut out of the public health system, um, not trusting the public health system, not trusting information they were receiving about their health care, um, and sort of communities um, who, you, you know, against the odds, uh, who were sort of often undereducated, underprofessionalized, um, lacking in expertise one would expect one would need to do certain things, um, uh, working together and galvanizing. So it's been really um, encouraging to have that work take on another life and become um, really, uh, you know, a, a book that's become important for, for activists who are thinking about mutual aid um, communities. So flourishing, I mean, I think about it both in the practical way. So the body and soul is very much like, what are the practical things that people can do um, to expand flourishing um, in a community? How do you have to work together, sometimes with corporate actors, sometimes with, um, in the case of, of working with you know, physicians, with sort of trusted experts, right, at a time when um, uh, medical doctors or the sort of medical industrial complex was was deemed to be un, you know, untrustworthy in particular. Um, but also, I think, uh, an ideal of, of, of flourishing as, uh, as an ideal, actually. And so I think about um, work in the, in the space of, of um, policy around and the implications of emerging technologies. And I think the affordances of new technologies um, offer us moments of pause Nobody's going to laugh at that? Okay. <laughs> um, none of my AI friends are going to laugh at that in my pause joke. Um, to sort of like, like literally think the world anew, right? If you have these tools that are going to um, fundamentally remake some social organization or how we work together, there are also these profound opportunities to say, like, you know, how do we, how do we want to work together and what do we want human flourishing to look like? Um, and so I, I very much um, take that into the space of, of policy making that one can uh, get a, a reset or a redo every time one's making a, a kind of a new policy commitment or a new um, a vision for, for, for how we might work together. So I think there are important both, you know, sort of practical and, um, you know, not quite utopian, but <laughs> ideal ways of thinking about flourishing. That's what Flourishing is a really big topic. <laughs> There's lots of things that we need. Um, but I wanted to talk more about process, actually, than outcome. 
when it comes to flourishing. And get back to the idea of democracy. Mm -hmm. And here's something I think we should all be aware of. And that is ordinary people in America, mo the vast majority really do believe in democracy. And this is super important. The question is how to implement it. And I want to give you an illustration of something that really worked well in the state of Michigan. So a couple of years ago, the voters, a bipartisan majority of voters passed a referendum to end gerrymandering of legislative districts, both congressional and state legislative districts. The campaign was called Voters Not Politicians. That is, voters should be drawing the districts rather than letting politicians choose which voters get to vote for them. This was a very resonated powerfully with Democrats, Republicans, independents alike. And so what happened was, in the state of Michigan, we overwhelmingly passed a, a, a referendum. It became part of the Constitution that the district lines had to be drawn by ordinary citizens, OK? Not politicians. If you were a politician or a party official, you were not allowed to serve. People did self-nominate, but then you just pull out of a hat, basically. Random selection, OK? So you had very diverse people on the committee who hashed it out. And I have to say, you know, that story about sausage making, that's also true for, for drawing districts among citizens. However, however, everyone really put their heads together. And even though the process was messy and sometimes ended in tears, <laughs> nevertheless, they took their jobs with absolute utmost seriousness and produced the first politically fair maps that Michigan has had in decades. And there's solid support for it. That's ordinary citizens working together on a project of different ideological perspectives but deciding that democracy was more important than victory for whatever set of policies they might prefer. And I think that's a lesson that we can take with us. I'm not saying everyone right, is on board with democracy, but I think a clear majority of Americans are. And I believe strongly that we should be extending experiments like this we do know also in cases of deliberative polling where many publics get together randomly that even though they don't have power the way this the Michigan Commission did, even without power, but they just talk together across differences, rural, urban, suburban, racial differences, gender, sexual orientation, different abilities and so forth, education levels, what have you, different religions get ordinary Americans into a room together with rules of civil discourse so that you don't have trolls and grandstanders messing everything up. Bring in social scientists who can give them like actual facts <laughs> and not all the nonsense and lies and misleading theories that they get on you know, their social media, but actual serious fact-grounded discussion and ordinary citizens of diverse perspectives, they actually tend to converge, not totally, they still have plenty of disagreement, but they get closer to each other. But even more importantly than that, they come out saying, wow, I thought all these other people, like I, I thought like I couldn't trust them. But in fact, they're reasonable. I can work with them. I thought they were horrible people, but now I've learned differently. And that's, that's even more important for the democratic process, I think, is restoring that kind of trust by bringing people together in appropriate settings so they can work out some ideas about what would be a good, decent policy. And to recognize that the differences are smaller than they thought and that they can learn from each other. I want to pick up on uh, these ideas about sources. Mm -hmm. and expertise, um, and maybe 
um, lean a little bit more into Alondra's recent work on, on um, uh, policies for AI. But Elizabeth, you've written about the difference in forms of knowledge. You've talked about um, uh, Wiesen, uh, you know, knowing facts that are general and abstract. You've talked about Kennen, the German term for familiarity with. Um, Local knowledge, situated knowledge. Um, and I'm wondering this contrast between expertise and intuition, let's say. Um, where do you think AI sits on that uh, <laughs> continuum, Melinda? <clears throat> I don't know. Um, uh, let me. Let me. I, I wanted to to, to um, rep, reply to Liz briefly, because I, I was just I was fascinated listening to her account because I felt um, of what happened in Michigan, but it left me with a lot of questions because so it's a beautiful account of um, deliberation of the kind you're more likely to see in Europe than the United States, so sort of engaging people in deliberative process. Um, but it was a, a kind of narrative that didn't come up against the limits of representative democracy. It was a narrative that was free of lobbyists or free of, you know, like just outside of that beautiful bubble of democracy were lobbyists who didn't want those maps to be done that way and are working very hard. And, you know, so I guess I'm just interested in the other sets of interests around this account, not that you have to answer, but I just wanted to sort of bring that to the conversation. I was also thinking about, you know, the data about, you know, generations younger than ours who don't believe in democracy in the same way. And, um, you, you know, the data in political science about democratic erosion. So I guess I just wanted to um, think about how we even begin to imagine scaling that particular account that you shared with us and, and, and what that might take. So I'm not answer, asking for you to answer, but I just wanted to talk through some of the things that arose as, that, as you were saying that. Um, Cal yeah, Real quick please. on that, California yeah. has a similar story as Michigan. Done differently, it was, you know, could we pick representatives to create a constitutional commission um, for redistricting? So and it's not unique to the Midwest. That uh, a number of states have started the process. Yeah. Um, but I think where I'm trying to go with kind of the intuition expertise is you described a world in which lobbyists weren't in the room. Um, but you described the world which you said social scientists brought facts. I also wanted to query, yeah. query okay. that. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> well, you need, I mean, you did need people that teach citizens like the consequences of different maps and give them ideas of like different notions of equity and drawing the lines and things. Yeah. All right to the expertise versus intuition. Alondra, where do you think AI fits along that? Oh gosh, what type of AI, what moment before, before a year ago, two years ago now? Um, you know, part of what was intriguing about the story that Liz just told us about Michigan is that, um, you know, I think fundamentally for us to get AI policy right and we're going to get it wrong more than we're going to get it right. It's really going to require talking to non-experts, to people about what the implication, about how these technologies meet their lives or might meet their lives. Um, and, uh, and I think there's something in between though, Woody, between mm -hmm. intuition and expertise, right? So um, I've been deeply um, both inspired and encouraged by the the two kind of Hollywood, not only Hollywood strikes, but the Screen Actors Guild strike and the Writers Guild um, strike um, that asked for specific concessions around AI. Mm -hmm. Not experts, but also not intuition. Um, knew very much what the implications of their of this would be for their work. So is, you know, are, are studios going to use, you know, new tools and systems to scan my whole body, to scan my, you know, um, and therefore can sort of use that again and again without giving me any, you know, any compensation for that? Um, am I gonna be asked to rewrite scripts that have been written by a really bad <laughs> hallucinating chat GPT? And can I you know, ask that that not be done as, as part of the setting the conditions for my work? 
so that's something in, I mean, it's both, it's expertise in the sense that I would not have known, I think many of us as policymakers or even evidence-based social scientists, maybe, mm -hmm. how to think about what the implications might be for the, the increasing expansive use of AI tools and systems in my workplace if I wasn't a screenwriter or if I wasn't an actor. I mean, I think, so the, there was a kind of expertise and a kind of experiential expertise about what the implication of our embrace of these tools means for particular kinds of work that I think even those of us working in the policy and governance space would not have gotten. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so that maybe would be a category sort of in okay. between. Um, well, I, I think of Elizabeth um, writing about situated knowledge or local yes, knowledge as being yeah. part of that. And auto workers in Michigan <laughs> worried about conversion to electric vehicles had yeah. the similar kinds of, yeah, okay. Um, why don't you uh, take us inside the White House, if you will, um, not to you learn want me about or the West Wing. Yeah, <laughs> I, what I want to learn about is your experience um, uh, trying to translate expert knowledge or academic knowledge mm. into white papers, into you know policy documents, into things that, um, well, not law. Um, like the AI Bill of Rights, but but we're what would you call them an affirmative vision? Like what do we need to know as social scientists to to be able to think about how that how that happens? I, I think the first principle is that we already know enough. Like the scholars in this room um, already know enough to make good policy, and you know you had to I had to learn it the hard way, which is you don't have time. There's no time literally for thinking or reflection or what we typically do. So I can't tell you how many moments I would be sitting in my office in DC and the gesture of like, you know, a student comes to talk to you and they're like, oh, I'm thinking about, I don't know, inequality. And you're just like, let me turn back and grab this book, this article that like that, you, you know, it's a kind of reflex almost. Um, and when you're working in government, and this was the first time I'd ever done it, and not something I ever thought I would do, you can't, you don't have time for that. <laughs> like there's no, there's no that. And, and you just have to go with what you know. And what you know is pretty much, is, is not bad actually. So it's a little bit like the, the analogy I've been using as I've been trying to kind of write up these experiences as those of us who are, are um, academics who are teachers, um, that moment where you, you know, you left your lecture notes at home, or you thought that you had put your, your, you had transferred your PowerPoint that you wanted to show your students onto your laptop, but it didn't transfer, it's on your desktop at home, and you go into the lecture hall and you just have got to give the bloody lecture. And, you know, and then at the end of the semester you get, you know, your comments and they're like, the best lecture of the year. <laughs> you know, like, um, in some ways it's, it's like that. It's really just like the storehouse of, you know, of, of what we know as fields, as what we know as a guild, is often enough to make the right decisions. You know, also learned that um, what policymakers need are things that we don't value so much, meta-analyses. Like, what do, we, what do we know about a given topic? Uh, you know, if we go, if we survey a thousand papers on a given topic, what does the preponderance of the evidence say about a thing? Obviously, the, you know, the incentive structures in academia are about smaller mechanisms or about making those um, s smaller sort of distinctions um, and the body of knowledge, and that's how knowledge advances and research advances. But for the policymaking space, um, you need to be able to translate that, like, you know, hundreds of years, half a century, decades of what we know about education, about inequality, about, um, you know, the STEM fields, about the research ecosystem, um, and to, to that. I would also say in this particular, working in this particular administration, um, you know, President Biden uh, is quite values things that are plainly stated so that people can understand. Um, and so there was also um, a real imperative to write policy memos, to write anything that you were writing um, to be clearly stated that, that, that any member of the public should be able to sort of read it and understand it. And you know, that's a challenge for, for academics as well. 
Was there an editor on staff <laughs> to help with that, or is that learning no. by doing? <laughs> we edited each other. It was the most, um, <clears throat> I think, profound experience I've had at collective work. So you have, a, at any given document, I mean, the, the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, uh, I, if I had to guess, a thousand people edited that document, right? Wow. I mean, like, it, it, it goes <laughs> all over the interagency. You know, people get to do red lines, you know, and it just is. And, and so it was, uh, you know, to Elizabeth's point of her positive ideal, it was sort of democracy every day in the work of government. Like, you okay. just, like... Everyone got a say, um, and it didn't get out the door until all of that, all of that happened. And you know, sometimes the red lines required a meeting, so it's like, oh, we might need to huddle on that, you know? Um, yeah. All right. So that's the redistricting taken to uh, um, a blueprint. Yes. In one sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, just just say a little more about um, it's not legislation, it's not law, but it's a vision. Um, how do you think about that? Oh, the AI Bill of Rights, right, yeah. um, in particular, or other, other things, right. actually. I mean, um, you know, the, uh, it is law for the agencies, right? I mean, in the sure. executive order? Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. I mean, no, this was not no. executive order. This was oh, before. It wasn't. Oh, yeah. this, was okay. the, this, was a, this was just a, guide, a white paper guidance document. Um, what to say? I mean, the things that we know, right, as, as sort of political sociologists, political scientists. So this is the, the, literally the world's most powerful bully pulpit. Um, you know, this is the seat of empire. This is, you know, all of the things that we know as scholars. And so something doesn't have to have the weight of law to be impactful. Mm -hmm. I think um, also because of this imperative that things be, language be clear and things be plainly stated um, that when the, the AI Bill of Rights was released, um, it went to schools, it went to state legislators. I mean, there were, I was talking to somebody earlier today who had taught it as a middle school curriculum. It was taught um, uh, in Cambridge by, you know, as, as, as middle school curriculum. Um, you know, state legislators were basing reg legislation on it, including a couple in California here, Rhode Island, Connecticut um, is, is doing an, an AI Bill of Rights. So it also um, gained traction, I think, both because of the, um, the halo of the White House, but also that it was a document that was useful for people. So part of what it did, it, it obviously, you know, it had several principles, but it was attempting to, um, in a very kind of STS way, mm -hmm. um, talk about how those principles were actionable and operationalizable in different forms of technology, through in different contexts, right? So schools, a government agency, um, and the like. Elizabeth, you've written, um, how to put it, about maybe you call it the proletarianization of the professions in your recent work. And, and curiously, medicine and education are, you know, they're the other regarding fields. You know, we are in the business of mutual sympathy, you would think, here in the academy. And yet you point out that people are leaving these fields in droves and they feel miserable. Why is that and what can we do about it? Well, I think uh, most people here are academics, so you're familiar with the proletarianization of the academic teaching core. It's happening in accelerating ways. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about health, <laughs> healthcare. Uh, my husband's a physician, so he's experienced this directly. He's in internal medicine. And the grind of documenting your work to the infinite detail for the sole purpose of maximizing billing gets in the way of effective medicine. Doctors went into this for the most part because they want to care for people. You open the chart, it has tons and tons of irrelevant information. You're looking for the needle in the haystack of the really important medical information about the person. All this irrelevant stuff is there just to document your effort, right? <laughs> And it becomes impossible to read another doctor's chart of, of, of your patient because you're sorting through masses of irrelevant detail. 
Another issue that's, that has arisen with my husband's practice is it used to be that when his patients called to get an appointment, they would be prioritized so that they would see him. But now they just assign every patient to the next doctor with an opening. So he's seeing more and more patients who he's not familiar with. But if you're, if you're in internal medicine, it's that direct personal knowledge of that patient who sometimes you've known for decades. And you can tell things about them that a doctor who sees them for the first time doesn't know, like, oh, this person's gait is just a little bit off. You know what I mean? But you wouldn't know that unless you knew the trend line from having seen them year after year. You lose, you, you lose contact with the people you know, but that's both education and healthcare, they're very relational professions. And that brings in the whole point about, it's not just Wissenschaft, it's not <laughs> just factual knowledge or stuff you could learn from textbooks and so forth. It's knowing the person and knowing them in a way where they're also receptive to your communication. Like you know how to communicate with them so that they can actually understand what you're saying. And there's also those bonds of trust that have been built up over years from seeing the same person working with them through all manner of problems that, they, that you've coped with together with them. Those bonds are critical, but they're getting frayed because of the, of, of the commercialization of medicine and the proletarianization of healthcare workers and they're getting ground down just by the demand to maximize revenues. And that happens even in nonprofit systems. <laughs> nonprofit systems have to more and more adopt a profit orientation because otherwise they lose their top specialists to the for-profit places that can offer them higher salaries. So the incentives are spreading everywhere. I'm tempted, I'm looking at the time though, um, I wanna ask a personal question, but I was gonna provoke us maybe over dinner about what is public serving expertise. But um, I, I, I wanted to ask you both something different. Um, and um, you know, both of you richly deserved uh, just a panoply of awards, honors, acclaim that you've received. Um, there's a graduate student in the audience here who told me, oh my God, Alondra Nelson and Elizabeth Anderson, they're my heroes. He's a grad student who studies STS and philosophy, so I won't embarrass him by pointing him out. But um, how do you remain on course? What, what are your North Stars? How do you think about in the midst of all this, acclaim and attention, um, keeping your focus on what matters to you. Um, I am really privileged and really lucky. And there are um, a million different reasons why my life could have been very, very different from what it is. Um, you know, I, it could have been you know, one wrong encounter with a police officer with a flat tire or getting a speeding ticket. It could have been, you, you know, there are just, a, just a lots of different ways that my life could have been um, very different. Um, and so I feel a tremendous, I mean, the North Star is, um, is that I have a lot of privilege and I've been very, very fortunate uh, and that that the, the sort of beautiful obligation of that is to try to make space, make possibilities, use power to the extent that one has access to it ever um, to, to make things and lives better for people. I mean, one of the things when I made the decision um, somewhat grudgingly to, uh, Marianne was around at this time actually, I think, to, to go to the Biden White House, and grudgingly for all sorts of reasons, was like, you know, government only disappoints, right? And, and I think never in our, it's the only time I've ever gone into a new endeavor and thought like, I'm gonna come out of this disappoint, like failing, right? You know, you know, like we don't, like we are the, the people in this room are the people who like, 
got the gold stars on our spelling bees in kindergarten, and like everything ever since was the gold star or whatever, you know. And so to go into an endeavor where you just know you're like more likely to, to fail than to succeed was like a daunting psychic cognitive thing, you know. But it also was like being asked to serve, understanding that very few people who come from my particular experience with my particular perspective will ever be asked or have the opportunity to bring that perspective to bear on the work of, of the highest level of American policymaking. And so I, you know, it's a tremendous opportunity. You know, I, I, I think also I thought, I, I thought this when I became dean at Columbia as well, which was also something where you're just like, you can only fail. It's like everyone's <laughs> gonna hate you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> at some point, everyone's gonna hate you. But you just, like, what's the worst that can happen? Like, so what is the worst that can happen for me, an elite upper class, black woman with tenure at an Ivy League institution. I go back to teaching intro to sociology. I mean, you know, like it's, <laughs> it's really pretty so, good. Gig. Yeah, you know, I mean, like, um, and so it's also about having, per, I think, real perspective about um, even what bad outcomes are and, and what good outcomes might be and working with others to try to, to advance the ladder. Well, you left that Columbia job to become president of the SSRC. No, I was doing both. You're, the SSRC is a part-time job, right, Sarah? Like CASMIS, <laughs> like, like, like leading CASMIS, right? <laughs> part-time. <laughs> well, you got a gold star for your term. time there, to be sure. Elizabeth? I think the key is, and this is actually runs really deep throughout my work, is to always remind myself of what I don't know. And, and who do I need to communicate with to find out? And this is just so important. So in feminist epistemology, we talk about situated knowledge. What that always, always reminds me is that is about the parochiality of my own perspective. There's a certain, in philosophy, that is a hard lesson to swallow. <laughs> Philosophers are probably like the most arrogant of all the humanists because we're taught from graduate training to always speak as if we're speaking in the voice from nowhere. Oh, I don't have a perfect <laughs> perspective. Like, I'm just like, this is like the truth. And, and <laughs> the objective truth. <laughs> That's true from all perspectives. And, but, I, but I really deeply steeped in the pragmatist tradition. And the pragmatist tradition says, You have oh. the chair on your slide. I was thinking about that. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Exactly. Yes. And so once you have that in you, that's one of the reasons why I'm like avidly reading all the social sciences, like everything, <laughs> right? Because there's all this stuff I don't know. So I have to consult with all manner of social scientists and sometimes scientists, hard, you know, natural scientists, to, to find out stuff. But also to talk with people who have different social identities and different experiences than me. And, and because, you know, I, I'm coming from a very privileged, you know, child of a professional, upper middle class upbringing in Connecticut, very sort of this weird New England state, <laughs> right? It, it's, it's very limited. And so if you constantly remind yourself about what you don't know, and that actually is also a philosophical tradition going back to Socrates. <laughs> so it's not as if, right, all philosophers have thought they knew everything <laughs> or could figure it all out just from inside their heads. <laughs> Not every, not every philosopher has thought that. And, um, and those are the philosophers who I think there's most to learn from, but also to go outside of philosophy and talk with people who know all kinds of other stuff in all kinds of different ways from personal experience and from their empirical research. Thank you. Please join me in thanking these two remarkable scholars. <laughs>